The first questions appear as quickly as the cancer. What are my chances? How much time do I have? Medical advances mean half of all cancer patients can be cured. But those in this report can't be cured. Their only hope, cutting edge cancer drugs. Many promise a longer and better life with cancer. The explosion of new medications is a blessing for many patients. But many drugs do little and escape true evaluation. Many patients have just one choice, try them and hope. If we're honest, we don't know if a drug will work. You can't get a word out. It's like being trapped in your body. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And I would never have linked these side effects to this drug. How safe and effective are these new cancer drugs? How well are they researched before they're released? We're seeing more drugs being fast-tracked, with less and less certainty about their efficacy. And we're spending massive amounts. 8.6 billion euros for cancer drugs each year, and the trend is increasing. How effective are they? Marion Rink has had chronic leukemia since 2007. Incurable. The disease is always present, every day, even on vacations. Photos of her last cruise. Look at this face. These cortisone cheeks. It surprises me every time. It's embarrassing. It's not. It's your life and my life too. I'm also too fat. But even when I look so awful, look how you look at me. It's wonderful. Her first serious symptoms appeared in 2013. She spent six months in hospital. Chemotherapy and high doses of cortisone brought her cancer under control. But then it returned, rubbing her energy. It was so difficult just moving from the bed to do a bit of washing up and then back. Things like that. You have to experience it yourself. This exhaustion, never-ending exhaustion. That was my experience. What would have happened if you hadn't received treatment? I would have died. Without treatment, chronic lymphatic leukemia kills you. With treatment, you can. What does my specialist say? You can grow old with an effective therapy. The chemotherapy wasn't effective. Just a few years ago, there would have been nothing more for patients like Rink. But there are new cancer treatments, and they're her hope. If you have a serious disease like I do, with very few drugs available, then you're trapped. You have to say at some point, I want to live, I want to survive. You're grateful there are now so many drugs. She's been representing patients for years on various committees. She knows the healthcare system. She knows that new and promising drugs are always being developed. Modern cancer drugs are often the final attempt to extend the lives of people who have incurable cancer. The Havelhöhe Community Hospital Berlin has allowed us to film despite the pandemic. It has a unique humanist approach and offers state-of-the-art cancer drugs in its certified oncological units. Each morning, the pharmacies deliver cancer drugs customised for individual patients. 
In addition to chemotherapy, new immune and antibody therapies potentially block certain mechanisms in cancer cells more precisely than chemotherapy. Oncologist Arna Musig has worked at the Centre for Outpatient Tumour Treatment since 2017. This is an antibody that we often combine with chemotherapy. These are two antibodies for a breast cancer patient, like a lock and key for a particular part of the cancer cells. Some of the new therapies cost many times more than classical chemotherapy. A lot of these very expensive drugs are not designed to cure the patient. They slow the disease and ideally maintain quality of life. Patients can then remain independent and they also live longer. For oncologists like Arne Musig, the range of treatment options grows every year. There are currently 237 cancer drugs on the market, a good one-third of which are state-of-the-art cocktails that are recombined again and again for more and more cancer types. He tries to keep track of this market of hope. New marketing materials arrive almost every day. This is a combination therapy that was approved for prostate cancer. This is for female patients with a certain kind of breast cancer. Here there are two combinations for patients with malignant melanoma. And finally, an antibody combination for a specific leukemia. That's two or three days worth of marketing material. I'm sure all my colleagues receive all this too. The superlatives are pure marketing, quantum leaps everywhere. How difficult is it for you to stay up to date? It's a lot of work. You can do it yourself by reading journals. That's a very important source of information without marketing. I don't have the time during my shifts to read up. That means I have to use my time off to stay up to date. Two floors up on the cancer ward. An alarm. A patient with severe symptoms is getting worse. Cancer is very advanced for many patients on this ward. In their fight to prolong life, Friedemann and Schad and his team always look for the ideal dose and combination of active ingredients. Bad news for this patient. We know the liver is massively damaged. Her liver is deteriorating. She knows it and wants to go to a hospice. When does cancer win? And when can drugs ward off the victory for weeks or even months? Will the patient even respond to treatment? Difficult questions. Ob ein Medikament wirkt. If we're honest, we don't know if a drug will work in advance. There are always responders and non-responders. The patient is told, we have a suggestion, we recommend this treatment. The likelihood that it will help is such and such. A lot of people are afraid, they're uncertain. We always try to offer the patient as much information as possible to make the decision. We don't want them to refuse a treatment that could help. This is the niche we work in. Marion Rink also has to research, weigh things up, come to a decision. Her leukemia had progressed and she had to rely on a new active ingredient. A promising new combination therapy had been released about four years earlier. It was supposedly more effective than classical chemotherapy. You really had no alternative. Not then, because we tried the traditional options. When I say we, I mean Dr. Ludwig and I. And nothing really worked und im Prinzip nichts wirklich bahnbrechendes angeschlagen ist. 
Und deswegen, uh, he carefully read all the studies he could about this drug. He told me again and again, there is something we can try. And an elderly man responded to it very well. And you trust that? She decides to take the new drug. Ibrutinib is an enzyme inhibitor that can very precisely slow down the growth of diseased blood cells. Studies showed that 42.6% of participants responded well to the drug. But after two weeks, something unexpected happened while on a short cruise. It started on the last evening. I said, let's go to bed early. I'm a bit cold and shivery. When we got up in the morning and wanted to leave the ship, I couldn't find my wedding ring. I always take it off at night. I panicked. Where's the wedding ring? Where's the wedding ring? I had to look for it. It was on her other hand. Then we left the ship and the situation with the bus. My husband said, here comes the bus, get your ticket. I opened my wallet and tried to enter a pin. Instead of taking out her ticket. You start thinking, what is this? She was also having trouble finding words. I wanted to tell a friend at our car about our vacation. I started to speak, but couldn't get a word out. I thought, what's going on here? I couldn't get a single word out. It's like you're trapped inside your own body. You know what you want to say. I had the images I wanted to talk about, but nothing came out. The next day, she drove to work thinking the symptoms would disappear. But the opposite happened. She was rushed back to hospital and diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, a transitory ischemic attack, or TIA, which had interfered with the blood flow in her brain. The doctor treating her at the Helios Clinic in Berlin Buch noted, we diagnose atrial fibrillation and TIA as an undesired side effect of ibrutinib. This tear, it came on so suddenly and without warning, there was no predicting it. It took half a year to recover from the side effects. Was it a known risk? Her oncologist, Professor Wolf-Dieter Ludwig, also chairs the German Medical Association's Drug Commission. What did you know about the drug? We had about four years of experience and knew that it had been highly effective with several patients who had already been treated with other drugs or had relapsed. We also knew that there were some rare side effects, like arrhythmia. I prescribed this drug since I was quite convinced of its efficacy because other patients had responded. As a doctor, you criticize yourself when it's a patient with a disease she can live with for 10, 20, 30 years and then suffers severe toxicity that may have serious consequences. TIA is not listed as a side effect in the 2014 clinical study. Why wasn't it discovered by the manufacturer? Less than 200 patients were treated in the study. Rare side effects and rare serious side effects may not be found. Approved based on a study with 195 ibrutinib test subjects. In 2019, five years after the drug was approved, an international research team analysed the world's largest WHO database for side effects. At the time, some 90,000 patients had been treated with ibrutinib worldwide. The analysis showed that 13,500 suffered serious side effects. 303 died of cardiovascular disease. 
254 had brain blood flow issues such as TIA. This analysis shows very clearly that there's a very long list, that some of these side effects, especially the blood flow issues in the brain, are not as rare as originally thought. It's a side effect we have to inform our patients of so that they can react quickly if necessary and stop taking the drug. It's not until September 2019, around five years after the drug's approval, that TIA appears as a side effect in the product description, along with a recommendation to regularly monitor patients. We want to talk with Janssen, the company that sells Ibrutrinib as Imbruvica in Europe. They offer a written response instead. We ask, how do you respond to doctors' accusations that insufficient information on potential side effects was available before the drug was approved? Among other things, Janssen refers us to a number of studies, without stating whether these took place before or after the drug was approved. Quote, Over 150 Imbruvica studies are ongoing and eight Phase three studies in the area of chronic lymphatic leukaemia. They continued, we continuously monitor the safety of our drugs and any potential side effects. And finally, Imbruvica's risk profile remains positive. These new types of drugs brought a new kind of hope when doctors started prescribing them around 20 years ago. Many even thought the battle against cancer would soon be won. But disappointment followed the euphoria. A 2014 analysis of 71 cancer drugs by the American National Cancer Institute showed that the new active ingredients could only slow tumour growth by an average of about two months. Statistically, some drugs only prolong patient life by a few weeks. Not easy for medical professionals. There was a drug that was heavily promoted for pancreatic cancer. In the end, it turned out that it only barely prolonged life. For some people, just 14 days. Still statistically significant. Okay, let's use it. 14 days is not a lot over a long period. But it's a dilemma for everyone. What doctor wants to say, I'm not going to offer this drug? And what patient is going to say, I don't want it? Some subpopulations don't respond at all. Why even use it? But then you could see that for some patients it did work. So you can use it in those cases. This is post-approval research. How do these drugs work in reality? How do drugs actually get on the market? What hurdles do they have to clear to be approved in Germany? The European Medicines Agency, EMA, in Amsterdam is responsible for approving drugs. This is where pharmaceutical companies ask for approval. They have to prove that a drug or a new combination of active ingredients both works and is safe. The process for regular approvals is always the same. In phase one, the drug is tested on a few patients. Here, it's about how the body processes the drug. In phase two, the medication is tested on several hundred patients, depending on the disease. Here, the efficacy of the new drug is compared to a control group that receives an older one. In phase three, the drug is given to several thousand patients. This stage is about determining the safety, efficacy and any rare side effects. But this standard is followed less and less frequently. New drugs are being approved faster. Officials want patients to benefit from innovative drugs as quickly as possible. Under certain conditions, drugs can be approved after phase two, after being tested on just a few hundred people. 
Wolf-Dieter Ludwig represents the German medical profession at the EMA. He's been critical of this trend in oncology for many years. I'm very critical because in oncology we have a significant increase in the number of accelerated approval processes. It is often not clear which patients would do best with the drug, and we know too little about safety and side effects. Authorities should only agree to accelerated processes in absolute emergencies, for example with diseases like COVID-19. We discovered extreme examples like this one. Approval of a drug for a special tumour mutation was accelerated for 17 types of cancer, but it was tested only on very few subjects. For around half of the cancer types, it was tested on less than 10 patients, and on just one patient each for appendix, liver and prostate cancers. Since 2015, 28% of all cancer drugs have been approved for sale using the accelerated process. The publicly funded Institute for Quality and Efficiency in Healthcare in Cologne, Thomas Kaiser heads up its drug assessment unit. He looks at all studies published on a new medication. The goal of the accelerated approval process for cancer drugs is to make them available to patients fast. But since we have no data on whether they are better than existing ones, we can't know if patients will actually benefit. Another reason why the institute checks every new drug after approval to see if it's better than the current therapy. If we look at these approval processes and we assess every new area, for example, every new cancer type the drug is approved for, we see that only about half of these newly approved drugs are proven to be more effective than a previous standard treatment. What does that tell you? It's not enough. It's not about saying it always has to be certain that every new treatment is much better than what is already on the market. But it would be good, or I would prefer, that a newly approved drug offers some progress. The institute was unable to determine any additional benefit from 46% of the cancer drugs approved since 2011. Hans-Georg Eichler, the medical director of the European Medicines Agency, EMA, in his private office in Austria. He's familiar with the arguments that the drugs are approved for sale too quickly and better data is needed. Much of what the critics say is not wrong. But on the other hand, we have patients who say, do you really want to wait another two years? Do we want to continue to do studies until it's too late for me to get this product? What's the right balance? We talk about drugs there is not much data on, which cure nobody. So is it still justifiable to say, we have to get all of this onto the market quickly? Yeah. You say that when you're healthy. We hear from patients and patient representatives who are sick. They say, we don't expect to be cured. We're satisfied if we can see a bit of improvement. So we take small steps. The question is, is a small step reason enough to, one, introduce a drug to the market, and two, do it quickly? Is our uncertainty about the treatment justifiable or not? Who should have the last word? I think it should be the patients. Allowing the patients to decide? Mari and Rink would have liked to have known more about the side effects so that she could have been better prepared for the potential risks. 
gelaufen. Ich da unbeschadet. How did I get to work safely? I must have had a really good guardian angel. Schutzengel im Prinzip. Ja. It would have been better to have known more. Yes, then I wouldn't have got in my car and put myself at risk. I would have called my doctor that evening. This is what happened, what do I do? And he would have said, yes, go to the hospital immediately and stop taking the drug. That's what would have happened. But if the data isn't available, if you don't know, there's nothing you can do. The medical world is trying to decide whether speed and access to drugs is better than more data about efficacy and side effects. We don't want to ask patients to wait for a drug that may cure their serious disease. The problem is that this is only one side of the coin. In individual cases, you might take this kind of risk in spite of not having so much information. But what is ignored are those patients who would act differently. The ones who would say, I want to know more about the benefits of this drug and what side effects it has and whether this drug will improve my quality of life compared to the chemotherapy. They're left out in the cold. Some of the new cancer drugs are considered by experts as innovative breakthroughs that work in entirely new ways. Oncological blockbusters, prescribed in the tens of thousands. At the oncological ward at the Havel Hör Clinic, we meet Petra Merke. Petra, a physiotherapist, has had skin cancer for six years. It's metastasized throughout her body. She's trying to stay active. I've managed to get this back over the past three days. I wasn't able to lift this leg at all. I'm working the upper muscles. That's essential for me to be able to walk. Her oncologist at the time prescribed her the breakthrough drug Nivolumab. Dr. Friedemann Schad surgically removed cancer from her lung to help her breathe better. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good today. I can move by myself again. According to the guidelines of the Oncological Society, nivolumab was one of the drugs of choice in her case. I was told by my oncologist that it was quite new, successful, especially for skin cancer. So I agreed. And I was satisfied with it. There were no noticeable side effects. I put a lot of hope into it. A number of different studies show that it can significantly stall the disease. And that's what often happens. In this specific case, the treatment unfortunately didn't take. The tumor continued to metastasize. We have the data we base our recommendations on. We have guidelines but you only see the effect in individual patients after treatment. What was it like when you got the diagnosis? That it's not right for me? I was devastated. And it included the news, you might soon suffocate. How are you and what's your prognosis now? Well, the current prognosis is, with brain metastasis, not good. Nivolumab can slow the cancer down significantly. It was one of the 10 highest selling drugs in Germany in 2019. Once this kind of blockbuster drug is on the market, it's quickly copied. Research is now ongoing into around 20 drugs with the same mechanism as Nivolumab. They differ only minimally. This presents doctors with the challenge of deciding which is the best. There's hardly any research into whether the second, third, fourth, fifth or even sixth drug from this group is better than the first. Sometimes the argument is, 
We need something else because it has certain characteristics, and the sixth is better than the first. Unfortunately, we often don't have the studies on them, but the second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth drug is approved for sale. But there are hardly any studies comparing these drugs. And that's a dilemma when treating individual patients. Petra Merker is at home again. There was nothing more they could do for her. Luckily, she didn't have any side effects. But the nivolumab wasn't able to slow down the metastasis. Merka is one of the 60% who, according to the studies, do not respond to the drug. For around 40% of patients, it can be a blessing. It gives them several months, sometimes even years. Petra's hopes, however, have been dashed. An honest conversation with the doctor is vital. That they say, that was it. I have nothing more to offer you. It's over. The metastases have all grown, especially the ones in my head, by 6 to 10 millimeters. When I read that, I'd say my prognosis is terrible. How long now? A week? A month? That's what I'm dealing with. I'm happy to be at home. There's no other option. Merka died a few weeks after our visit. The patients battle on in hope. Whether the drugs work, how well, for how long, is uncertain. One thing is sure. The health insurers spend more every year on cancer drugs due to longer life expectancies. More patients, many new medications, and ultimately because the new drugs are more expensive than the old ones. The costs of cancer medications rose from 230 million euros in the 1990s to 8.6 billion euros in 2019. How have the new oncological drugs affected cancer survival rates? The Robert Koch Institute in Berlin collects data from all German cancer databases. Cancer is no longer always a death sentence. Over half the sufferers now survive. Klaus Kreivinkel compares the survival rates over time. This is the progress in survival rates. In the 90s, we saw greater progress in the numbers than in the past decade. According to the Robert Koch Institute, the survival rate increased significantly between the end of the 90s and 2007 by 12 percentage points thanks to early detection, operation techniques, radiation and chemotherapy treatments. The hope was to raise the survival rate even further using the new precision cancer drugs. But since these drugs were introduced, the survival rate has only increased by a further three percentage points by 2017. constantly increasing costs and few victory celebrations. Was it at least possible to manage the costs of the drugs? In 2011, the German government began controlling prices in an attempt to ensure effective drugs would be available at fair prices. A joint government committee evaluates whether a new drug is better than the current standard. One year after approval, the final price is negotiated between health insurers and manufacturers based on the committee's conclusions. Jörg Schaber is a patient representative on the Joint Government Committee. We can take a look in here. On one side sit the health insurer representatives and the ICBIG Quality Institute, which does scientific analyses for the committee. And on the other side are the patient representatives. And behind are the representatives of doctors and hospitals. The manufacturers, the pharma companies, aren't they here too? The pharma companies are not involved in the discussions, which are supposed to be independent. 
They have to work out how good a new drug actually is. Does it offer more benefit to patients or not? And the manufacturer can prove that by submitting a fat folder of documents laying out the benefits of their new drug. Usually, the talks go on until there's an agreement. If the committee decides the drug is better than the current standard, the price can be set higher. If the decision is negative, the price cannot be increased. Whatever the decision, the drugs remain on the market. This isn't really satisfactory either, because in reality, these drugs haven't been sufficiently tested for sale. I think that's a big problem. The drugs are often approved based on interim results, before the study is even completed. The studies are often designed as sparsely as possible to minimize costs and maximize speed, because the earlier the drug is launched, the faster the pharma industry can make a lot of money. Once the drugs have been introduced, no matter how effective they are, the Joint Government Committee can only influence the price. It can't remove a drug from the market. We do some research. Pharma industry profit margins are much higher than in other branches. We find information about Ibutrinib too in studies and industry journals. The research and development for Ibutrinib cost around 388 million US dollars. By the end of 2019, the drug had brought in around 25 billion worldwide. The EMA granted Ibutrinib orphan drug status, an incentive to develop therapies for very rare diseases. A good idea in theory. Orphan drug status compensates on profitable research into diseases suffered by a maximum of five out of 10,000 people in the EU. Manufacturers have to pay no approval process fees and are granted a monopoly for 10 years. But many of these subsidized drugs have proven very profitable. In 2019, 20 orphan drugs generated revenues of over 1 billion euros each. This trend is very worrying because we're putting money into the wrong channels. There are many metabolic diseases in children or other diseases where the manufacturers are not motivated enough to spend the money to develop new drugs. Janssen's Ibutrinib is ranked second among the highest selling orphan drugs worldwide. The EMA cannot remove orphan drug status just because an orphan drug becomes a blockbuster. We ask whether Janssen is willing to give up Ibutrinib's orphan drug status and the accompanying market advantages or to reduce the price. Janssen's response. The European Commission decides on the allocation of orphan drug status. And pricing? We look at the benefit to the patient as well as the added value compared to alternative treatment options. In addition, pharmaceutical pricing is precisely regulated by law. We follow the Joint Government Committee's benefit analysis. The price of a course of drugs must yield pharma companies sufficient returns to incentivize them to do further research and development. Cancer drugs are the most expensive medications. New gene therapies, for example, which are the subject of intensive research at the moment, cost up to 275,000 euros per patient. Forecasts estimate that costs for cancer drugs will increase by 10% per year worldwide. How long can health insurers play along? Pharmacist Wolfgang Kasbach has the same question. He has internal experience with price negotiations between health insurers and pharma manufacturers. He's now a mediator and arbitrates when insurers and pharma companies can't agree. If the drug offers additional benefit, a monetary value somehow has to be calculated. 
What's it worth? Who knows? That's what's negotiated. Is the additional benefit worth 1,000 euros or 30,000 euros? There's the old businessman's rule that the discount is already in the price. They overprice in advance because they know their price won't be accepted. Pharma companies aren't charities. They should be able to make profits. But they should also keep the financial capacity of the national health system in mind, because that's who they profit from, who they're paid by. At the moment, a lot of money is being spent, so grab what you can while you can. Right now, they have no shame. Shamelessness in some pharma companies' pricing. What does the Association of Research-Based Pharmaceutical Companies think? They too respond in writing. Modern cancer drugs give many patients a longer life with cancer, and more and more often without any cancer at all. So new drugs add value to society and the economy. Wolf-Dieter Ludwig would like to see better data. More money for independent research to better understand the opportunities and risks of the new drugs. The large number of drugs being pushed onto the lucrative cancer, where you can demand very high prices, means we already have many drugs we don't need. It's very difficult for oncologists to separate the wheat from the chaff with new drugs. Marion Rink is now taking a new drug for her chronic leukemia. It's working. And she also tolerates it relatively well. I promised my daughter I'd live to be 80. It was a bit uncertain at times. I'm really trying. And it's tolerable. What do you wish for your wife? That she can continue to live without too many constraints that she doesn't suffer too much, that she can enjoy life, and that she can stay with me for a long time. <laughs>